Our plan is to talk about archives and uh, performance research here in the Northwest, as Sasha mentioned. And we have three wonderful presenters today. In your program, you'll notice that there's a fourth presenter, Heather Davis-Fish, who's not able to be with us today. But I know that we're going to still have a very interesting session. What I'm going to do is I'm going to start with Yuri, and then Selena, and then Patrick. And each one of them is going to share with you 10 minutes in answer to a selection of prompt questions. So ten, their 10 minute response. And I think all of you have visual images, is that right? Yes, okay. So prior to their presentation, I will share a brief bio. That will give them time to connect to the internet and do those nice things. And you'll also know a little bit more about them, which is fun. After that, then they are going to have a bit of a discussion between them. They'll have a chance to ask each other some questions. And then we'll turn it over to you. And you'll have a chance to ask questions. And then I will say stop, <laughs> because you'll want to ask more questions. <laughs> but that's all the time that we'll have. <laughs> so how does that sound? OK, and what I didn't tell you is that I'm going to give you two minutes at the eight minute mark and that Sasha and I talked about it and decided that even though this room is small, that sometimes it's helpful to use a microphone. So that's what we're going to do. So please let me introduce to you Yuri Colin Chang, who is a Vancouver-born scholar and current PhD candidate at the Department of Theatre and Film at UBC. He obtained his first degree at the School of Communication at SFU and a second degree at UBC before embarking on his doctoral research. His current research, A History of Asian Canadian Theatre, 1971 to 2018, is being funded through SHRC and UBC's four-year fellowship and the Public Scholars Initiative. Yuri uh, has a background in the not-for-profit sector has worked as a writer, editor, arts manager, and dramaturg. And he tells me that he, as a pedagogue, his teaching specialties are early modern Shakespeare, um, tragedy, and Western theater theory. And he uh, also has lots of academic writings uh, published, including in Theater Research in Canada, Canadian Literature, and Playwrights Canada Press, and Arsenal Pulp Press. So thank you so very much for being ready to open for us. I'm going to pass you the mic. Thank you very much. I um, hope everyone can hear me. Um, thank you very much to the organizers and for in, um, including me in the discussions. Uh, so briefly today, I'd like to speak about uh, the individual and community archives that I've been um, engaging with of recent um, through two specific companies. One is uh, Fujian um, Asian Canadian Theatre Company based in Toronto, and the second is uh, Vancouver Asian Canadian Theatre. Um, I'll just, just tell you a brief story before I show you some photographs of uh, photographs from the last 15 years. I met with Joyce Lamb, who's the founder of Vancouver Asian Canadian Theatre, and I went to her home and I re realized quite quickly that she had archived um, on um, phone core as well all the posters from the last uh, 15 years of Vancouver Asian Canadian Theatre, and I was privy to this information. So what started off as a tea conversation ended up being a whole afternoon of going through some of these um, posters, and I'm just going to show you these that have never been seen in this collection before, I mean, uh, put together. Um, Vancouver Asian Canadian Theatre began as a non-profit in 2000, and they began with a kind of a, a comedy annual uh, festival, so before they were even producing professional equity-based productions, they started off um, producing what we call the Asian Comedy Nights, and this is an interesting, t a fun take on One Ton of Fun, an MSG-free byproduct of the Vancouver Asian Canadian Theatre. Um, what you'll see here is, whoops, I'm so sorry. Um, and uh, on the bottom, you can barely see the Tetsuro Shigematsu here, who's uh, the author of One Hour Photo and Empire of the Sun, um, directed this production. And second from the top is Tom Chin, who became kind of the uh, master of ceremonies for all the future productions. Uh, the name that came uh, about was Etcher Ed Sketchhoff, and that became the annual comedy festival's name. And this is a, a more recent poster from 2011, and it's quite interesting. So it's like the Empire State Building with Tetsuro holding Tom Chin in his hand. And so that's just a, a kind of passing of the torch, as you see. 
a lot of the posters were done in kind of like a pop culture phenomenon. And here we see the lucky uh, or unlucky cat. Um, usually in the Japanese culture, the white cat would be a, a symbol of good luck. And he's actually sitting on a voodoo doll of Tom Chin right there. And there's a double unlucky is the theme. Um, again, um, based on the Etch-a-Sketch etch um, item that many of us grew up with, and that's Tom Chin on the top there in 2010. Uh, Vancouver Asian Canadian Theatre also produced many American um, classics and contemporary uh, Asian American classics. The Odd Couple by Neil Simon was produced. There was a production in 2018 at the Waterfront Theatre of Flower Jump Song. And one of David Henry Wang's earlier works, FOB, which is Fresh Off the Boat, was produced um, also by the Vancouver Asian Canadian Theatre. So even before the production of original um, writings by people of Asian descent, there was a kind of import of Asian American uh, contemporary classic plays. And this is one of the very first uh, uh, Asian Canadian musicals called Red Letters. You have to excuse that, the quality of that image. It was taken on my phone. Um, Sex in Vancouver, which was based on Sex in the City TV series. That was very popular. Cowboy versus Samurai, Exit the Dragon, etc. Mm -hmm. And so, um, and this last poster was quite interesting, um, is there's Jay Hamburger of Vancouver produced the Theatre in the Raw, and that was done in production of the Downtown East Side and Carnegie Centre. And two of the plays in this particular year were produced by Asian Canadians, Sign of the Times, and Joyce Lam, who was, a, was the artistic founder of the company. And so my experience with the Community Archives has been quite enlightening. Um, so what I've begun thinking about is in terms of the relationship between my work in community archives, most of the work that I have found has been held in individual collections. Mm -hmm. I've also um, been in the home of another um, elder in Toronto, and uh, I found that there's a very particular sensibility and a very particular interaction with materials that I have not experienced in institutional archives. So I began thinking about the whole notion of what is a private collection and trying to map out what what that feels like and what that experience is in terms of going through the process. So my, my experience in terms of the accessibility of individual archives that are found in, in attics and in, in, um, in people's personal boxes is that it's a very discursive and relational. To be invited into somebody's home to actually be able to talk over that material is, is, is a very rare experience. I find that that sensory and tactile experience is very heightened because I'm being exposed to, to old props and old sets and anything that's put into the boxes. So there's there's no rules in the private archives. And so that uh, t tactile sensory um, aspect is really powerful for me. And last and uh, most uh, least is the multimodal aspect of the memorabilia, as I mentioned. Um, in terms of the restrictions, I've been thinking through how we would articulate an owner-based restriction, which is essentially, if I want to go back to that archive now, I have to call up my colleague who I happen to know and have a relationship with, but it's not accessible to me, nine to five. I actually have to call her up now and go back into her home and have her bring up the boxes. So in that sense, um, it's not replicable, uh, re repeatable, and it's not unsearchable. It's unsearchable um, only if I go to, through those boxes and no one else has access to them. I have started to actually engage with institutional archives, and more recently I signed this waiver form um, at the University of British Columbia, where there's also some fawns donated by elders from the Asian Canadian theater community. And this is what I signed, and it's quite interesting because I, I found myself um, responding quite um, viscerally to this. Reports, uh, papers, dissertations, or any other works describing the results of my research will be written and are presented in such a way that no individuals in the requested uh, records can be identified and no linkages can be made between personal information. Now, when I went into this archive literally three weeks ago, I knew the, the person who donated the fonts. He was one of my mentors at the Asian Canadian Writers Workshop. And most of the people who are in these archives are my colleagues. So not being able to identify them personally and any personal information is, is somewhat problematic to my research. And I'll tell you why. So when we go back down to the context, it suggests that third-party personal information covered by the uh, special collections includes racial or ethnic origin, and I'm writing history of Asian Canadian theater, <laughs> religious or political beliefs or associations, which is very important in terms of alliances, and employment, occupational, or educational history, which is part of my history as I tease out where people have studied some of their aesthetic preoccupations and their lineages, yes? So I'll briefly talk about um, um, the institutional archives, you can see quite briefly in terms of what some of the benefits and, and, and uh, consequences are. Of course, there's a consistently available archive at UBC and elsewhere, uh, University of Toronto, Guelph, 
it's easily searchable and replicable, and there's organizing fonts that are, are, are neatly captivated. But on the other um, flip side, they're legally binding, and there's very depersonalized non-disclosure. You know, I was asked to put my bag away, all my clothes, and wasn't even allowed to bring anything other than a piece of paper and a pencil. And so those are some of the things moving forward. I just want to talk about two examples, and I think I have to pass it off. Uh, one is from uh, a production that I wrote my master's thesis on, actually, eight years ago. Uh, and it's called Lady in the Red Dress. It was David Yee's um, preeminent play that uh, garnered him a nomination, the Governor General Award. There are three characters here, Maribel Coogan and the baby, and Tommy uh, Jade. And Tommy Jade is one of the figures that goes back in time during the immigration act. And Tommy Jade is played by Inge Choi, the author of King's Convenience. Mm. And so what's really interesting about this moment is that um, there's two things that happen. We find out that Coogan, who's a government official, has gone off on leave. And during this time, his wife um, seduces Tommy Jade. So they actually have a, have, have a baby together. And that baby becomes the title character, Lady in the Red Dress. So kind of mixed race baby. So that moment at the time... Uh, gestures towards um, anti-sanitation laws that came out of the United States and influenced some of the ideologies in British Columbia. And as well, um, there's a little bit of dialogue here that I'll, I'll uh, read and then I'll pass off to my colleagues. So basically what's happening here is uh, Coogan is acting unofficially as a government official and he's asking for an additional $100 on top of the $500 head tax. And you can read right here, um, we will find, find a way um, to bring her in China. See, your wifey's application, it was rejected. So now we go a different way. Do you bring her to Canada? Yeah? Tommy looks confused. Money paid tax, insurance paid intercontinental relocation fee. So he's asking for an extra $100 and basically putting Tommy Jade in a, in a predicament right here. And then later on, in scene 17, they come back, and now Tommy um, realizes that Chor Swan, his wife, is not coming to Canada because there's a Chinese exclusion act. Yes? And that lasted literally for, from 1923 to 1947. But in the scene here, David E. has an envision it as a, as, a, as a mishap. Max says the Exclusion Act, and Coogan says, is that just a temporary law, Tommy? It's not permanent. Look, I have it on good authority that that will be lifted in the next six months. And of course, that was not the case. Um, so right here, again, this, this moment is fictionalized, um, but it actually gestures towards particular times in Canada's immigration history. And before I end, I'll just uh, read a, a brief uh, synopsis from David Yee's program and how this connects to the performance histories of, of, of the Pacific Northwest. Although this uh, play was premiered in Toronto in 2010, it actually was developed at the Playwrights Theatre Centre here in Vancouver um, with Don Hanna as the dramaturge. And I've also directed a staged reading here in Vancouver at the Playwrights Theatre Centre in 2016. And um, the actual histories being told is actually here, um, based in Vancouver. So David E. says, I wrote the play in response to an email I received from an MP in British Columbia. Uh, the e email itself was a response to a petition I signed in opposition to B, uh, Bill C-333, which attempted to quietly sweep a number of issues, mm -hmm. including the Head Tax and Exclusion Act under the rug. And that was just before the formal apology in 2006, when Stephen Harper apologized for the exclusion act um, and the mistreatment of Chinese Canadians. Um, and so here's some photos from other photos, that, uh, other shows that I won't um, talk about. But I want to end with uh, just some thoughts on the archives and how we can move forward. So I've been trying to theorize um, part of my dissertation research in terms of how I, I make archives palpable for communities beyond just the academic community. And so, uh, based off of some of the notions that were espoused by Marvin Carlson in his book, as well as Rebecca Schneider, I propose a concept of archival ghosts, which is developed out of my theater research and refers to the hidden, untold stories of characters and narratives from Canada's exclusionary past. Given the historical ratio of visible minorities from public affairs and political life, I argue that institutional archives are plagued by knowledge gaps or archival ghosts. Um, so rather, the process of recovering late 19th and early century um, stories is a recovery of ghosts that requires new systems of storing, experiencing, and sharing the archives. And so such sites of knowledge, I contend, and propose to the Gatherings Project co-investigators, um, would be ideally based on ongoing dialogue, accessibility, and embodiment, and a personal and familial cultural history. Thank you very much. Thanks, Jerry.
That was an excellent start to this conversation. I'd like, now like to introduce you to Selena Couture. She's an assistant professor at the University of Alberta in Edmonton in Treaty 6 territory and Métis homelands. She researches Indigenous performance, place, languages, historiography, and a parallel inquiry into performative constructions of whiteness. Her publications include Against the Current and Into the Light, Performing History and the Land in Coast Salish Territories, and Vancouver's Stanley Park, which is from the Gillen Queens Native and Northern series, and out in January of 2020. So if you haven't heard of it, um, there's still time. It's brand new. And also on this patch of grass, city parks and occupied land. So thanks, Lena. That looks like my very small number of slides is not going to work. So I'm not going to worry about it. One more try. No worries. I'll just tell you. I'll describe what they are. Um, so hello, everybody. Uh, it's really uh, such a pleasure to be here um, on the territories that Sasha acknowledged. And uh, part of what I'm going to explain to you today is uh, how I work with archives um, in my book that we just recently published and in my continuing work um, really with a, um, an effort to, uh, to use what I can, how I get rethink how I understand archives, but also to use what I am able to find in the archives, despite the archival ghosts that my colleague Yuri talked about, um, in order to understand better where we are now, what's happening where we are now, and my positionality in, in relation to all of, all of that and my responsibilities. And so I'll, before I start, I'll explain I'm an 11th generation descendant of French settlers and a sixth generation descendant of Irish settlers who came to the lands that are now known as Eastern Canada, 380 years ago. Um, 134 of those years have been on lands that are treaty, um, specifically the Upper Canada Treaty, Peace and Friendship Treaty, Treaty Number 2, and now that I teach at the University of Alberta Treaty Number 6. So if you do the math, that means that uh, you know, two-thirds of the time that my family has been here has been in places that are not actually accessed through any kind of formal negotiation, including where I spent most of my adult life um, in the unceded ancestral traditional territories of the Hunkamanum speaking Musqueam and Tlaiwakash peoples and the Squamish indigenous speaking Squamish people. Um, and it is there in that in that place over in what's known as Vancouver is where I began to learn how to have a different relationship to uh, to land and to indigenous peoples who care for that land. And particularly thinking about um, what I understand is actually part of what I'm going to talk about is a uh, a kind of archive that is contained in, a, in an indigenous language um, about how to be a, how to be a, a respectful visitor. And in the Hunkaminam, that uh, that is a fit in Manitan, and that's a word that means uh, a person who walks alongside. And so that is very much of what uh, the work that I have done in the archives has to do with understanding what are the what are the actions that my ancestors uh, have taken to try and create a white place, um, and then also. Um, what actually, um, how performance and performative archives that are pr produced by Indigenous peoples um, maintaining and maintaining their sovereignty in their Indigenous land. Um, and so, the the, the ma major piece of work is the book that Heather just mentioned that was published. It's called Against the Current into the Light: um, Performing History and Land in Coast Salish Territories and in and Vancouver Stanley Park. And it is really a double. Uh, Sort of a parallel inquiry. Um, it begins with the, the question that I began with was how is how is this place been maintained as an indigenous place? And how has performance been part of that? Um, and of course, archives and repertoires and understanding of performances actually transferring knowledge and holding history is of course an important part of that. What also happened as I engaged with that uh, Western archive is I began to find a parallel inquiry into how a kind of whiteness was created through a performative activity of the Vancouver's archive. Um, which I'll explain a little bit more. Um, my work, so the questions we were asked is how does your work engage with performance histories in the Pacific Northwest? So that is a huge piece of work that I have been doing for many years. And then a piece of what I've learned from all of that work has to do with um, and the methods that I've developed to understand how to be in a different relation to land. And then, of course, um, and the 
understanding actually what has the settler invasion of this land be, and what are the results of that, and of course the Wet'suwet'en um, act, the active, active violation of the Wet'suwet'en territory is very much a result of that. So that's, uh, that sits on me heavily as I, as I speak with you today, that this is all part of what I am working to try and engage with, and that actually understanding the archives that we have inherited um, critically is a, a, a piece of how we could actually move forward. So I'll explain a little bit to you. Um, just come on. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. um, so, um, next question that was asked was how does your work intersect with performance archives? And uh, performance archives for me are, I think of them in, in multiple ways. One is uh, as knowledge held within indigenous languages. Um, that, that knowledge is archived in, inside of a language. Um, sometimes quite literally, um, so we can think of them indigenous languages as held in archives, um, often though without access for indigenous people who want to speak their own languages. Mm. That, that's actually been part of the, the damage that archives have done, um, and the damage that needs to be undone that I hope Jerry Lockman will speak a bit about tomorrow in his keynote. Um, but also really thinking about the knowledge that's held within a word. Um, the word I spoke to you about in Manitan, that's a, that is a way of like holding on to knowledge, and then speaking it is a way of, of transferring that knowledge. Um, and uh, I think a really important way of thinking about, about knowledge that steps outside of a Western archive. Um, and that's a, a very significant concern of the book and, and a way that I have learned to think differently about where I am. Um, another way I think about performance archives um, is through the kind of Western conceptions we have of archives, that most people here would understand that archive is existing, um, mm -hmm. and particularly the city of Vancouver's archive. Um, mm -hmm. And sometimes also I worked in the BC archives held here, which we're going to visit. Um, so through a, a very critical engagement with the City of Vancouver archives that I didn't expect to happen, but because as I spent more and more time there and, and covered the story of that archive, it became very clear um, that we needed to really understand where how it was created and who created it and what what manipulations were part of that. Um, uh, particularly by a man named James Skip Matthews, who was the first archivist of Vancouver. He's began the archive in 1931, and he stayed the archivist until he died in 1970. And he was not a trained archivist, he was passionate about old things. Um, and it's a very unusual archive, but he also intervened in that archive very considerably, and also had an, a vision of himself as, uh, as, per, as creating a, a performative engagement with archives to create a public history. And so it happened, I was studying Stanley Clark, it happened that J.S. Matthews had uh, an obsession with Lord Stanley coming to uh, Vancouver in 1889 and dedicating the park. And he, uh, as part of his work as an archivist, uh, created reenactment ceremonies of this, uh, this dedication over and over again, which eventually resulted in um, a statue that sits at the, at, the, at the entrance to the park. It is actually, uh, well, we might talk about it in, the, in Joseph Roach's ideas, a surrogation or a displaced transmission of uh, a, 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 an idea of what Lord Stanley did there. Um, which I could talk more about, but it's a really interesting you know, performative engagement with an archive by a, an archivist who intervened very publicly to try and create those ideas and those stories of, of a whiteness, of a British whiteness, a benevolent British whiteness in Vancouver. Um, it's not, I mean, it's a, I think for anyone who lives on the coast, it's a really important story to understand if you're going to write history of this place. Um, in terms of archival questions that the Gatherings Project asks, I think it's also really interesting to um, to understand that it's not unusual, that, although the story seems remarkable, of that of the City of Vancouver archives, it was the first municipal archive in all of Canada by more than 20 years. It's the first purpose-built building of a municipal archive. Um, that story all has to do a lot with this character, J.S. Matthews. Um, but it's also not, I think, in trying to understand settler colonialism and invasion that happened here, it's not unusual that an archive um, would be created in that sense. And the people that, um, as Cole Harris, who's a geographer, talked about in the resettlement of BC, that, that the tension of a people without a local history, the need to create an archive. Or as Sarah Ahmed talks about in queer phenomenology, the kind of nauseous, I think she says, the nauseous and horrifying uh, feelings that one's own contingency. And the way that an archive would actually try to, um, to alle alleviate those things for settler colonial invaders of the place. 
who have actually no legal right to be here. This is unceded territory. There are no treaties, and this territory is actually uh, the contingency here, as we see with what, what's happening with Wet'suwet'en, what is a real contingency, despite what we feel like as we walk around this beautiful place. Um, so the last question, we're probably close to other time. Two and a half minutes. Two and a half minutes. Okay. Um, the last question that I was, we were asked are what are some of the challenges and pleasures in your view of working with archival records of performance? And of course, in working with uh, anything to do with Indigenous peoples in a Western archive, it's one of the challenges of what's missing in, your, in these archives. I mean, which of course is, that tells us about the limitation of those archives, that of course they aren't complete and they are manipulated. Um, I could tell one interesting story though about that gap with the archival ghosts that Yuri's talking about, and um, which was certainly a frustration. I was one of the pieces that I, one of the chapters in my book is about uh, the city of Vancouver's 60th celebration of its founding in, in 1946. And there was an Indian village and show that was there at Snock, which is now known as Hanley Park, but um, it was in a huge installation of two weeks of performances. There's quite a lot of documentation of the Native Brotherhood of BC um, were commissioned to put on that show. They're a very political organization. They were doing some incredibly interesting, important political work. There were no, there were no images of that event. Um, I, hmm. my initial engagement with that archive thought it was because the archivist wouldn't have cared, but they wouldn't have thought it was important enough to archive. Um, as I worked and worked with those archives and eventually found, if I could show it to you, I would, um, <laughs> a letter, uh, an assignment of copyright to Chief Williams Cow. And it was a dozen photos of Indian dances that were he purchased from the Jubilee Show Citizens Committee for a dollar. And, uh, and it was actually, it was misfiled. <laughs> it was, it had the photos beside it. The photos in, and they were in a thing about the Jubilee show, which was the 1946 event that happened in Stanley Park at Sofia. Uh, that was a celebration of Vancouver, but it was very strange. Like there was, there were no settlers in this photo. It was all indigenous people. There were quite extensive masks. that wrote ceremony. Like it was a very strange thing. And then eventually after talking to an archivist at that, at BC archives and other people and doing some more investigation, it turns out those were not, they had nothing to do with that event, but somehow the Citizens Committee had copyright of them and acknowledged that they, that's not a legal copyright by any means by, you know, selling these to, for a dollar to William Scow. But just that strange document, which it really didn't necessarily have anything to do with my, my work, eventually made me rethink what that frustration I had about the missingness of those photos, that those the missingness of those photos was not necessarily a, a sort of an ignorance or an obnoxious understanding from the archivist themselves, but actually could very well be um, an assertion of sovereignty, an assertion of refusal. That yes, we are actually going to perform, but we have we could not give you permission to record anything that we are performing. We are performing it for our own reasons. <clears throat> during the potlatch ban and the, and the ban on any kind of dance, there could be very good reasons for the Native Brotherhood of BC to make these performances. Um, and yet also assert, um, assert sovereignty to refuse to, or refuse to, let, uh, to, be, to let anyone archive. And so I can't prove that. You can't prove anything when you buy the gap in an archive. However, that small misplaced copyright um, mm -hmm. document just at least allowed me to try and think differently. about that archival ghost. Um, I think that's probably my 10 minutes. We yeah. have to let you more. <laughs> okay, so that's where I'll stop. Do you, do you have one more point? Nope, that was it. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Congratulations on your book. Now I'd like to take this opportunity to introduce Patrick. Oh, Patrick, I should ask you how to pronounce your last name. Lenkar. Patrick Lenkar is an interdisciplinary artist and director. His recent works feature sustained investigations into the history and function of the book, the politics and imperialism of the English language, and the history of labor and value. He has a degree in philosophy, theater, and film from the University of King's College, and an MFA in interdisciplinary art from Simon Fraser University. He is the co-creator of the Card Game Meets Archive, Culture Capital, that's all one word, and he is the lead archivist of VideoCan, an online video archive of Canadian performance. And uh, 
I'm very curious. Okay. Uh, I'm just getting set up here. So, uh, yes, my name is Patrick, and uh, it's funny hearing like I'm talking about the gaps because I'm going to be talking about things that. Sorry, I'm going to be talking about things. Huh. Uh, I'm going to be talking about things that I know exist, um, but we don't have access to uh, for various reasons. So, uh, video can is what I'm here to talk about. The card game meets archive is called Culture Capital. Um, I don't think I'm going to talk about it, but if uh, if you want to learn how to play the game, it's in my bag, and I'm happy to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with you. Uh, some people just won $500 of Canada Council money, competing all the way through a tournament in Edmonton uh, last week, which was very exciting. So, coming to Toronto, possibly, in the summer. So, Video Can is uh, described by things in notes, which are over here, and uh, ostensibly, I should just say, um, its main, it's just here. Okay, so its main function is to create an online video archive of Canadian performance. Um, who's doing this? Uh, me, uh, Milton Lim, who is one of the members of Hong Kong Exile, Peter Dickinson from the Institute for Performance Studies, and Simon Fraser, who I think a number of people here probably know, uh, Mariah Horner, uh, who is uh, an artist and uh, sort of emerging writer. She's um, Team Jen Stevenson right now on a number of projects. Oh, I was just going to keep doing that. That's okay. Uh, so uh, why why would uh, artists? So it's an artist-driven initiative to ostensibly collect video archives, video documentation, full-length video documentation, to put it into an online uh, archive. And as I said before, these videos exist already. In order to be a professional artist and functioning artist in this system, you have to produce uh, basically video content to be shared with presenters. That is how performance that you see gets programmed. Because not all curators can travel the world to see the work. So this work exists, um, and it uh, after it has sort of lived its life, it doesn't necessarily go anywhere. Um, so what we do as we, um, I'm going to have to bracket the sort of detail of it, but Culture Capital, the game, is built out of interviews. And when we do those interviews to create that other project, which I'm not talking about, we ask people for their video documentation. And uh, if you've ever been on Ubu Web, this is basically Ubu Web for Canadian performance. So it's theater, live art, dance. It's totally open access. Anyone can put video into it and anyone can access the content of the catalog that we are compiling. Um, the reason why it's artist-driven and not part of any institution is that there are too many walls in between um, the user and the archive itself for you to be able to open it up in a rehearsal room and use that material effectively. Um, and that is my goal. That is how I've come to be an artist, and that's how I learn from uh, my peers, people I've never met who are making works in all parts of the world. Um, we use video to understand what people are doing and to develop a certain kind of rigor uh, with our practices. So there's a number of uh, goals, I suppose you could say, uh, with Video Can. Uh, one of them is specifically to create a resource and a tool for artists to be rigorous about how they're interrogating what other people in Canada are doing with performance forms. Um, restrictions on uh, some of the challenges I'll talk about in a second, but the restrictions on the dissemination of video that are in place by certain bodies, uh, like uh, organizations in the country, are restricting the ability for artists to be more rigorous with each other's work. Um, uh, secondly, uh, we cannot afford to go and see work over and over. We cannot afford to travel across the country to see the newest work by whatever company in whatever city. Um, if you live in a part of Canada where none of those works are ever going to come, now with the death of Meg North, um, you, know, you might never have sort of larger companies come to town. There needs to be a way for artists in those spaces to access work that has been made in the last number of years. Um, as it was mentioned in my bio, I did my schooling in Halifax. I waited every year for the new Tubi or Zupa theater show to happen. Um, that's incredibly frustrating, and that's not a way to develop rigor 
aesthetic and philosophical and conceptual artistic rigor with your practice in relation to the other people in the country who, as a community, we are supposed to be in dialogue with them. So video can is possibly not the, the end all way to solve that, but it is one way that we hope that artists can use and learn from each other's work. Uh, the second goal is for people who teach classes to young artists and people interested in performance um, to use this in your class. Please use it. If like It's going to continue to grow. I'm sorry I can't tell you when there's going to be a thousand entries in it, but it's literally just us doing it. We skimmed the money to pay ourselves to do this uh, off of our Canada Council grants. So, but please use it. Like assign Hong Kong Exile in your class, assign Social Growl Dance, assign Sasha Ivanochko, Zupa Theater. Like we have videos from these people. Um, when I did a contemporary theater class, I didn't see an entire video of something uh, in that entire class. And that like, strikes me as strange. When we have the capacity to do that, and I know that video is not, uh, uh, well, I'll talk about that in a second. So what are the challenges? The challenges are uh, that there are biases against video, um, especially in theater, dance not so much. It's And when I say theater, I, in this context, I'm saying theater theater, so not theater performance or sort of more conceptually engaged theater practices. Um, but the large contingent of Canadian theater that uh, resists this uh, project is, uh, or those who have resisted, are those who have a sort of a, a prejudice against the video being worth seeing. Uh, it's called video can, and I guess they think that video can't. Um, we say it can. Uh, we say that there is something worth gleaning from video documentation, and we need to move beyond any kind of, like, oh, well, it's not really good enough. Um, in order to access the catalog of video can, you have to take this very pithy oath, which I'm going to read out loud. Um, we change the password every month, so you have to keep agreeing to it. But uh, it says, I recognize the importance of documenting and sharing live performance through digital technology because I live in the 21st century, and even though I know it's not the same as really seeing the real thing, I won't complain because I understand that my video can still capture important aspects of the performance, and I think the value of sharing work is greater than some of my aesthetic prejudices. Amen. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, that's, you know, we try to remind people, like, let's move on, right? Let's move on. Let's move on past the debates about how theater is, like, purely ephemeral. It's not true. Rebecca Schneider's come and blown everything up already a long time ago. So let's, let's be pragmatic about what we can use with this material. Uh, the second challenge, I'll just say, I'll just sort of show you what a little bit. There's about 30 or 40 people in here right now. So it's just a URL to a password. It's all password protected. Um, if you've got sex acts or things that you don't feel comfortable about having like on video that anyone can access, we just put your email so that the artist or the person who's interested in seeing it just contacts you directly and says, hey, I'm Patrick, I'd love to see that show. They at least know that I have accessed it. Um, last thing, the challenges uh, uh, are, yes, these uh, prejudices. Second, especially in theater theater, is that we have the association, the Canadian Actors Equity Association, um, which has instilled a very real fear in artists across this country that if they were to disseminate their work for educational purposes, they would be either fined, legally like uh, abused, or whatever it is. The fear is so real and so debilitating for theater, theater artists in this country uh, that they won't even sometimes talk to us. They won't entertain the idea that maybe, even though everything is plastered as um, for educational use only, uh, that uh, that equity wouldn't come after them. For the record, equity is not a union. They do not stand up in court um, as a union because they are not a union. And so those fears are actually just sort of perpetuated um, as a sort of social phenomenon. Uh, and I think that's the end of my time. So uh, I'll just say, why is this coming out of Vancouver? Um, it's because we're here. Um, it's where we're starting. There's also a lot of scrappy and independent aesthetically rich and rigorous work that has come out of this area, I think, in the last 20 years, um, that hasn't made it to the other parts of the country yet. And there's a lot of places in Canada that could still experience aesthetically the revolutions that sort of took place in Vancouver, and it would be very worthwhile. And so in some ways, I hope that you know, we can be a conduit also for North Pacific Northwest to move out, but also have other things to move in to classrooms and studios. Uh, and that's my bit. Thank you.
Thank you all three of you so very much. This is really, really interesting. And the next part of this program includes panelists talking to each other and asking each other questions, but I got the mic. So I get to say a few short things of some themes that I think are really interesting that resonate across these really different explorations of work and ideas. So I heard everybody talk about gaps. But I heard you all talk about gaps in different ways. So I think that's a potentially interesting area to go into chatting. I also heard, um, Patrick, you talked, uh, um, actually, I heard all of you talk about being in relationship with somebody as part of your archival work. And I think that's very interesting, too. Um, I really like the idea of theatrical ghosting. I think that applies to all three of these conversations. So I think that might be worth chatting about. And I thought the comment about how to be a respectful visitor, which goes along with relationship, but I think that's also very interesting in archives. So there's other things to talk about, of course, but those are some prompts that I'd like to offer. And Selena, since you're closest to me, I'm going to hand the mic to you and see if you'd like to say anything or ask uh, other panelists some questions. writing a couple of thoughts down. Um, Is this on? Yeah, thanks. Um, so the, I mean, the, the comment on, on gaps certainly resonates across, across all three. I mean, it's interesting that just because you just spoke, Patrick, thinking about the, the gaps that are a result of the fear of reprisals and fines um, for something that is actually being like uh, uh, Continued despite the actual reality change. I mean, that's, a, that's an interesting way of thinking about like the when we work in archives, we find we find what we find, and we make we do the best we can to make use of that. Um, but we can't always understand why we're not why why things are excluded from it. Right? So some like that probably right notice that I found, but also something like that that actually many people might not understand if they don't understand the background of the, what life is like. To, to work as an artist in Canada, to, um, to uh, why you might not be willing to share, right? Like what, what are the repercussions of that? And that kind of like uh, control of power over, over these things. And, and the other, I guess, piece that, make, that makes me think about your work, Mary, too, is the personal archives you spoke about and that <coughs> lack of accessibility and the need for a relationship in order to access those. And that, that, that actually makes that power dynamic come clear. I mean, what is it, who's sharing with who and why are they sharing? And I guess a little bit of when you talk about when you interview people for cultural capital, and then once you've made that connection and they understand who you are and the way that you want the projects you want to disseminate in the world, then that trust is created. Right? Um, and the institutional archives, which as well as explained, bring, you know, to lack of any possibility of actually creating an ongoing relationship default to that uh, thing you showed us at your sample, right? That, like, they can't actually trust you without, for sure, because we don't really know who you are, but we'll put this into place instead. So one of the things, um, like we're learning as we do this, like a new artist will say, I want to submit this, but it makes me feel this or that if I submit it. So that's where the clause about we'll put emails in to be able to make sure that like, you know, like I have naked 19 year olds in a, in a show and do they want to have that on in some parts of the world? That's totally normal to put that online. But for the artists who I had in my cast at that time, no, they don't want it on. So, but I want that work to be able to be contributed to a dialogue um, in some capacity. Uh, and I think that we've been thinking a lot about what the, um, when, you, when we talk about personal archives, like you know, you're, you're talking about all of these materials that were produced for these festivals. Um, those materials were purchased through public funding, usually, and so there's a big question for me about the translation from public funding into object that then gets becomes personal. If that makes sense. Um, so some people will say, you know, like I don't want to include my show in your archive. And that's interesting to me because it's like it's a five hundred thousand dollar investment from like the Canadian government ostensibly, um, but the nature of 
philosophically of what public funding means is that there's a kind of stripping away of certain responsibilities to the public and a kind of in, uh, endowment of a, of a, I can do whatever I want with it. The Canada Council doesn't really follow up, follow up right? So, um, so that to me has become really interesting of like, I've got this material that was produced through public money, but I now have a right to say no one can see this anymore. Um, that doesn't really make a lot of sense when we start to break down or it calls into question to some extent what we're gonna do with publicly funded production of materials that should be, should they not continue to be accessed through public archiving in some capacity? Hmm. Um, yeah, maybe I'll respond to both. I think, Selena, you mentioned the, the, the notion of uh, like wh why would we share, why not, uh, why, why wouldn't a community or an individual share? And I'm thinking uh, specifically related to my research, and possibly yours as well, but the notion of uh, uh, intercultural, uh, the legacy of shame and or trauma, and how, uh, like in the Japanese community, I think it's like we, we close down that uh, dark chapter in our history, we don't talk about it, and we move on, right? And that, uh, that, gener that, uh, that generational um, ideology that that hardship had been experienced and the next generation does not have to experience that. And to bring that up and actually document that for a lot of communities, whether through uh, official form or just oral testimony is, is, is quite a big, um, and like, it's a, it's a huge gesture. And, and some of the artists, I didn't get to show you the, the photos from the Tashmi project, which is basically Julie Tomiko Manning of Montreal and Matt Miwa of Ottawa documenting um, elders who experienced um, being interned in Kashmir, BC when they were children and now they're in their 60s telling that story and having two uh, mixed race uh, actors come into their home and actually ask them what was it like as a seven-year-old to live in the internment camps and having them resist in front of them while they're being interviewed for a show and that kind of sharing now is documented publicly through, through Canada Council and published in through its Canada Press but that the notion of actually um, the, the collapsing of theater history and actual cultural history and the trauma of the memory, I think, has to beg a question of why, why we would expect, just because it's publicly funded, that it's accessible to everybody in, in a free reign, right? And so, for me, that's a question. And the other one, in terms of like what you're, what you're dealing with with video in terms of information, I'm always wondering how we define the archive as the place to go because of the university and the municipal and national archives are our default trajectory, then we we bypass the the gatherings yeah, project websites or the the individual or scholarly based um, on not just online but other kinds of repositories. Um, and the last thing I'll say before I give back to Selena is that I haven't experienced an individual who has not wanted to give their personal materials over to an archive, I don't think there's um, necessarily a wherewithal or a knowledge of how that is done. I only know two or three people in my community who actually have huge boxes in the Robart Collection at University of Toronto, in Guelph in the Connolly Collection, and now in the UBC Special, um, Rare Books and Special Collection. So three people of my 120, you know, some odd folks that I'm documenting over 45 years of Asian Canadian theater who have personal farms in institutional archives. And it's not because they, other folks don't have boxes in their attics, they all do. But the energy and the time and, yeah. the, and the trust that would, that it would entail to do that. And, um, yeah, I think you bring up a really, really important point about, about uh, the kinds of trauma and memories that can actually be contained in these archives, which we think of ourselves as subjective researchers just you know, wanting to know, but actually the, and, uh, the point of trust is a really important point of like the, that um, the sharing, of a, sharing of knowledge in a relationship that is built on trust it can actually not just uh, make the knowledge more accessible and impactful for the next generation, but the building of that trust is what I think is important. That, that key, key part of this. Uh, I just switched switch tack a little bit here. I had a question, uh, question for you. I was really interested in the kind of teeter totters you were making of restrictions and accessibility and, and 
personal and institutional archives, I guess. Um, and um, we spoke about the, the tactile, um, you know, the, the experience of the tactile and, and the materiality of those objects. And so I'm just, you know, I just want you to uh, to get you to expand a bit more on the significance of the materiality of objects that you're finding in these sites. Like, like there's all these other sites, you know, Patrick has shown us this videos which you see on the screen and it's material but it's a different kind of material that you see. So uh, you were showing us posters, some of which are found to Marie and there may be some like that. But I, I just would like you to speak about that materiality and object. The, well the experience I had in one home was uh, in think by the Toronto Elder, she's still signing permission forms, so I won't mention her. But she's in her seventies and she was invite I was invited into her home. I only had some email communication with her before, and I know of her work in the community, but I was invited into her, her living room where she served me tea and literally went upstairs um, to bring down a few uh, files. And in those files were photographs of her um, as, as a young actress and as well as a CV. And then half an hour passed and discussing uh, people of our, of our community that were there in the 70s and 80s, like Rick Shiomi and Terry Matata, what have you. And then she went back up into her attic, and this is a woman in her 70s, very sprightly, and she brought down two photo albums, two symposium booklets, and uh, some other materials. And there was literally chock full in, in, in her arms. And as she opened the album, she was flipping through, and I can say that she went to McMaster University, and she was in a production of Romeo and Juliet with Eugene Levy. And she had just passed through, and she goes, oh, that's just me and Eugene, and, and she went to McMaster. And when she said that, I, I, I kind of perked up, but I also thought, wow, this is, for her, it's just her life, but for me, it's like, this is archival gold, right? <laughs> really experience that. And for me, sitting down, and even if, and, and then she did actually give me the first book at the Symposium on Non-Traditional Casting, which happened in Toronto, and she was she was the curator and document uh, documentarian of that, and she gave me that on loan, and I still have it. And that tactile, um, there's a huge trust in that, like you say, the, the idea of trust. And, and by contrast, when I'm in UBC, I didn't know whether they had uh, videos recording. I'm okay with video. Um, but at the same time, I felt very constrained sitting there. I, I, I couldn't take photographs, whereas when I'm in somebody's home, that negotiation happens immediately. Um, whether I can take photos of those posters, like I did with, with uh, Vancouver Asian Canadian Theatre Founder. I took photos of everything that I was touching, and then I was given some. In the official archives that I've experienced at the university level, I'm barely allowed to, you know, carefully go through these, these, these. and I appreciate the energy that goes through the organization of the fonts, but my whole, my whole being and my whole body uh, senses differently, the experience is different. And so I'm actually I'm actually recalibrated to be hyper cerebral, and, and ironically, as a scholar, that's actually discomforting. So my experience with the archive and how I'm processing is, is significantly different. Mm -hmm. um, anyhow, that's all I have to say. Sure. I was going to say, why don't you make another comment and then I'm going to open it up to the floor? Okay. I was just going to ask Yuri if, um, if the temporal quality of the works that you're touching greatly affects that perceived archive goldness that you, do you know what I mean? Like when it was produced, age, history, some some sort of assumed philosophy of significance of a historical, something that feels, this is history, you were beholding it as history, as opposed to like the program from No Foreigners from like this past October, right? And the perceived difference in the value of material I mean you're looking deeper into history and excavating gaps right so like it makes sense but I'm wondering like, when we talk about the sort of experiential quality of being an archive whether in some ways that that's being over not overshadowed but definitely colored by our sentiments around the significance of just experiencing history um, in this place right well here's where I would say your your project would be value because I cannot find a video archive of any of the Asian Canadian theater productions that were produced from 1983 right. and I'm still looking but the, the goal that I'm experiencing is that in relationship to the material there's a human being there that was there and so that's like speaking with one's parents or grandparents or another generation and I'm very cognizant now um, you know as I get older and I've lost parents that, that 
generations don't, you know, they need, people move on. And so that, that oral history and that memory is there. And, you know, in terms of no corners, I think in about 10 years, if I were to sit back down with someone like Milton, then there would be a kind of richness to it. But I think that comes with time. I don't think it's me. I think it's you. <laughs> well, any questions or any comments or ideas you'd like to share? Thank you for the recent presentation. Uh, just here, just uh, reflecting on some of the things you talked about. And I think a major thing that kind of jumped right at me is the idea of ethics, you know, ethics of care, whether from a personal perspective, which you're really, you know, reaching out to uh, individuals in their homes and all of that, or to the institution, or to the video video can and, and what that means whether you know as we experience that culturally. So I just wanted to kind of like three things based on the idea of ethics and maybe you can speak to it. One is that the whole idea of power relation, because I think that who says what, you know, who says what, when it's said, who archives what and all of that. I think there are bigger questions we kind of connect to what you were talking about in terms of archival process. So maybe it might be interesting to kind of dig deep into that idea of why, why archive, archive goes? You know, what does that mean in terms of power, power dynamics and power relationship? Uh, the second thing is the idea of authorship. So at the end of the day, it's the public one that was used to create this. At the end of the day, whose archive is, is it? You know, gathering materials from different per set of different performances. So I think that from the you know, ethics of who, who, who's, who owns it at the end of the day. Uh, and the third thing is, is really about accessibility and the concept. So you really were talking about when you go into a home, there is always that relational interaction with the material versus when you are in an institution where you really don't have a connection to the story of the person in a personal way. How does that speak to that idea of consent and all of that? Thank you for that. Is it Tyler? Yes, Thank you for this, those uh, bringing together those ideas. I, I mean, my first like thought about ethics maybe when I worked in a university is the research ethics board and ethics approvals and the you know the the work that you have to do as a as a researcher related to an institution and the incredible necessariness of that like the harm that has been done to the research is legion and you know and absolutely research ethics boards are necessary they're also inadequate actually right? the basics of research ethics is a, a good beginning part but then the actual work uh, the communities has to it goes definitely beyond beyond all of that. And some of what I think you're talking about is yes, it's all the research ethics board of BBC and <laughs> carefully like getting consent and all that as, as you would need to do. And you're building beyond that as well. So that's just my, my first thought on the topic. Well I, you know, I actually think I'm in, I feel somewhat in between Selena and Patrick because Selena was a, a, a cohort ahead of me when I was a master's student, and Selena was a PhD colleague. So I looked to a lot of your work in terms of how you went about uh, your research with the city of Vancouver, and how um, how much you, how much time you spent just in in the archival materials, and how how you actually had to go back to that, right? So that repeatability for me was really important. But the ethics around um, who gets to see, who gets not, for me, it, if I get to see, that's that's a negotiation that I have with that that one person who's holding it. It's different with the institution archives, but the relationship is navigated by the person whose material you know that I'm seeing. But I'm not the person that's negotiating. The relationship dictates how whether I go back or not, and whether that's shared beyond. If I go back to any of these folks and say, now I would like to document these photographs properly with a high definition camera and put them on my website, that's a different kind of negotiation that has to go beyond the ethics of the university, I think, even though I'm a research subject in the university. You know, when I'm at UBC, I'm bound by these, and they're very constrained, but I, I understand them. You know. Just to add to that, it made me remember a piece of, like, a way that uh, when I worked at the City of Vancouver Archives, they had their own expectations of the use of their materials, and, um, and I, of course, followed all of those, but then, that mistake, the mistaken copyright assignment that I found, um, it included all like those twelve photos that were the copyright was assigned to William Scow. It was not; they did not like they. It wasn't theirs to have in here. But if I followed their rules, I could have reproduced those photos. I could have distributed them. They had no restriction on them. But because I had 
you know, through the work, uh, the communities that are willing to work with me, I began to understand there was a larger ethics than institutional ethics. That actually, even though the institution would allow me to reproduce something that I would not, it was like the, like fulfilling ethical obligations if I did, like because of what I learned from the communities that it was so gracious to, to work with. I guess I should say something about ethics because people like to ask us about it too. Um, uh, we're not an institution, um, we're just people who consume video. I'm still the type to torrent video, like films illegally. Um, and I think that there's other people in this room that do that too. It's, uh, hey, how's it going? Um, I know you all stream and steal your parents' Netflix if they've got it, or your child's Netflix. Um, so, uh, but it's a very real thing about um, you know, I had to write like an archival policy kind of thing that was really boring to write. And, uh, but at the same time, I understand like the necessity of it. Um, we try to be, you know, we're going to make mistakes. We're going to, you know, we learn along the way, like a video gets included and, um, we figure out how to make sure that it's like the person is respected. We don't force anyone to put anything they don't want to put into it, into it. Um, we encourage them to take risks and see that their work is valuable beyond its hidden private memory sort of form. Um, it's open access, so like if you're like, I love this project, but I'd love it to see go this way, like become an archivist with us and hang out and encourage other people to sort of participate and influence us, that's uh, more than okay. Um, we're really quite, you know, rhizomatic in that sense. Um, we uh, definitely are coming up against questions around like who owns the material, just like anything on YouTube. We say we do not own this. Um, we give links to everyone who actually owns that material and redirect people to those people. Um, as far as to access, I mean, so I, it sounded like there's a lot of people who have rejected this. It's only a few people. Most people are incredibly excited about it. I should say that. Everyone's actually really happy about this existing, <laughs> except for just a handful of people who are hilariously um, stubborn. Um, but one of the arguments of those hilariously stubborn people was, isn't this taking it away from artists? And I thought that was really interesting because for them, they were like, well, people should just email us directly to ask us for our archives and to see our work. Like, yes, their video's already on Vimeo. Um, it doesn't say that their videos are on Vimeo, anywhere on their website in any capacity. Um, and you know, you gotta have a certain amount of chutzpah to like cold email uh, your favorite theater company and be like, hey, can I watch your stuff? Because if you've tried that with the Wooster Group, such as I, they will ask you for $400. Um, mm -hmm. And so that's a bit of a deterrent in some ways. Uh, and so there's a, for this particular company who I'm speaking of, uh, recently much lauded and prizes, uh, they, uh, they felt like we were taking things away from a, like a relationship between people and artists, or like artist to artist, mm -hmm. which in my opinion is insane, because if this is togetherness, um, we have a law, like what? It doesn't make any sense to me. Uh, there is a way that we can be in communication with each other that is, uh, that embraces a certain kind of radical democratization of access. And the traditional models of cold emailing the person who has the thing, um, yeah, it takes a certain amount of privilege and power on the behalf of the accessor that I would like to bypass mm. for people, especially students, especially students. Like I want students to watch Hong Kong Excel's work and be like, this is dope, I wanna make that. Um, and they don't need to email them directly, they're too busy. But, Questions for Patrick, and it's about uh, the quality of the recording. So I was wondering, uh, I've seen I've seen a variety of, of recordings, and I'm the type to contact a company and say, hey, can I, do you have an archival recording of this or that? Um, and some of them uh, are kind of hard to go through because of the, the quality that is either really good or quite poor of the recording, while others are just uh, is very pleasant to go through because there's no like there's practically no effort. Yeah. So I was wondering if 
you accept any uh, like any material regardless of the quality of the recording. And if you do provide guidelines for people, aha, it's here. So okay. it's, uh, I'll respond to you. Okay, and if you uh, if you you give guidelines to companies who might want to to produce something to give to you, yeah. but who might not quite know how to go about to produce a recording that could be so, put in there. Yeah, I can say something about that. So, going on. Uh, uh, so yes, uh, we have a judge not by resolution uh, belief um, that uh, don't judge it by resolution. Um, we are trained already to privilege 4K and you know high pro high frame rate video. Um, it's kind of like when you watch like we don't actually I don't know is anyone else like film scholar kind of into that stuff where it's like 24 frames a second has conditioned the way that we think video should look. So when the Lord of the Rings came out in what like 48 frames a second, people were like, "What the fuck is this? I can't." It made them feel nauseous because it was moving in a way that was too similar. It was too close to, or like a, an interstitial space between, um, like whatever frame rates that we're accustomed to. So uh, yeah, our judgments come out immediately when we see things of like lower quality. Um, I mean, we all used to watch 720p video like 10 years ago, and if someone sends you a 720p video now, you'd be like, oh my god, this is awful. Like it's so, mm. it's terrible. But that was the only thing that like DVDs are 720p. Like we watched it for like as long as those were alive. Um, so. Yes, we, we say it doesn't matter what it is, as long as it's the full length. It has to be the complete video, the complete performance. It doesn't matter the quality. And yeah, if it's terrible, like we'll sift through it. Some people got really scratchy handwriting, I know that's in archival stuff, and I guess that's an analogous challenge, right? Um, looking through like a deteriorated pixel plot. Um, <laughs> which I know is a concern that like, you know, fit rot and all that kind of stuff, we can talk about that later. Um, but, uh, for teaching people what to do and how to do it, uh, we've considered, we are going to put in a grant to actually start paying for people's documentation and hosting our own kind of guerrilla video festivals where we will pay for documentation at different performance venues across the country. So we'll hire a local video team to do it, and that way we get like high quality documentation of a specific, that's where we will continue a curated wing of what we're doing. And curated is in like, we're just going to fund their video documentation, ideally, and then include them in the archive. Um, we have notes about like you know how if you have questions about how to do it, let us know. But most people who are working in performance now, they 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 know it's tripod and camera and and zoom mic. Um, we're available to, but we can't we can't sustain a kind of a teaching of it, or like a, there's not a course that we're offering. But if anyone wants to ask. Like, and I guess maybe that's where I should make, make a note to make it more clear that you can ask us for help. Um, so we'll do that. I'll add that after this panel. Um, yeah. Uh, thank you. Um, oh, I'm so productively provoked by so much uh, today. And as a 30 year member of both Equity and ACTRA, there's all kinds of dialogue I'd love to have with that. <laughs> you talk. But I, 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 I'd like to ask about it, perhaps more specifically directed to Selena and Yuri, um, this concept of um, sharing, acquiescing to sharing, um, uh, validating sharing, and choosing not to share and all the various um, strategies, both overt and covert, about that. Um, uh, it uh, makes me reflect on a current situation in Toronto, where I'm from, and uh, a former student of mine, who is really becoming my teacher, Yolanda Bonnell, mm. and her play Bug, that's being co-produced with Native Earth and Theatre Pass Mirai, has broken with long theatrical tradition here in Canada and the Western world to invite critics, reviewers from established news organizations, free tickets, uh, and uh, in um, and for reviewers to offer critique and uh, perhaps um, um, advertising for their work. Anyway, this hasn't been 
So Yolanda has, uh, with her play Bug, which had been in Blue Monado Festival, and she's had experiences with this piece in particular, uh, of course, as many of you know, um, uh, has um, spoken into this custom and, and uh, refused to give out opening night tickets or permission to review her show to any uh, um, journalists who aren't uh, Indigenous, Black, or people of color. And as there are none of those people on staff in what is certainly a declining uh, um, system of organs that disseminate this kind of information, uh, that means that in that sense, uh, this work will not be reviewed. And as I understand it, a large part of her action and the action of the um, uh, theater makers supporting her and the producers uh, is because uh, she identifies the work that she's doing as ritual ceremony to which everyone is invited, right, to be part of the community mm -hmm. that shares in that ritual performance uh, ceremony. Um, but it is a protest against Western biases of critique. Mm -hmm. And so I guess just the, it, it just maybe you could talk into that a little bit, the difference between uh, sharing and community and uh, mm -hmm. notions of critique and the powers that those critiques have traditionally held. Thanks for con connecting that uh, very contemporary refusal that is, I, I think, on the, much on the minds of many people in the theater world, just certainly in central Canada. Um, given uh, my perspective out on the West, it wasn't surprising to me because I know that Kim Senator Harvey um, also refused with her with the production of Kamalupa to allow white critics and instead um, love letters were, were uh, published by indigenous women who saw Kamalupa and I believe Yolanda was one of the performers of Kamalupa. Yes, yes she's yeah. acknowledged that yeah, influence. Right. So, so there's that influence and, and so it's not um, it's a possibly a growing practice it's, I mean, and I think one that makes perfect sense and what I understand is uh, indigenous res resurgence and uh, assertions of sovereignty and refusal and that there's like Clearly, a refusal. I mean, the way, the way Kim spoke about it here when Kamalupa was on was that um, it wasn't that she was shut down to any to intercultural dialogue. It was that she had this incredibly massive job of producing this work of Kamalupa, and she didn't have time to educate all all mm. of the people who were about to go to both Patrick's work is uh, talking about you know the the critiques of theatrical works live forever on the internet, and so um, and I've read uh, some of Kelly Nestrick's like responses to this and the, and actually the dialogue between her and Karen uh, Karen Nicolette, the, the Karen Nicolette one. And um, and I'm struck by Nestrick. Uh, I teach uh, Death of a Chief, which is a really important piece by the State of Earth Performing Arts, and Nestrick's review, a response to that that Yvette Hill speaks about it, the dismissal of that work is like, why would they do it in theater? And like that lives on, that lives on, and it does harm. And so I think it's a a not surprising result of the kind of like indigenous assertions of sovereignty and refusal that that's now also a piece of theatrical culture that has now spread to central Canada, which means the rest of the world will, will, will think about it, right? Um, but I'm not, I'm not surprised that that's part of it, and I think it's a, it's a piece of the work that has to be done. I think that um, in some ways what is happening in that gesture also is a recognition that um, I'm just trying to sort of like tie this into the fact that like I mean I've been engaged in those dialogues as well about like what is the rhetoric that we need to have around theater today theater and performance mm -hmm. um, part of our objective when we start to fund putting stuff into the our own archive is to start modeling dialogue around how to talk about the relationship between works and to model a kind of aesthetic I'm almost going to say like a scientific rigor that has been taken out of um, our theater practices because we see a work once, not three times, not enough times to actually be able to dig into like what is it doing. Um, and so there is a history of criticism. I think all of, I mean, if you're in the academic institutions, like we know that like there's a lot more specificity to be made about talking about all this work that happens in this country and in this world that is performative. Um, and in some ways, the 
public one is a form of marketing. It's compromised in mm -hmm. some capacity. And it's not that it's not doing good work and not doing important work, but there's a reconciliation that we can now have with what kinds of language can we produce around performance. Like, I think that that has to be the next way that we can go forward as critics, because now any anyone can be a critic, sure, but um, we still have a need for modeling a kind of rigorous discourse around performance that was clear, that clearly failed Kim, that has clearly failed Kim's perception of what was being offered to her work and to Yolanda. Um, there's a perce perception of an inevitable failure, and so, but the the success, what the success to come out of that, isn't limited just to necessarily cultural understanding too. It's also, I think, there's been people for decades who've been desiring a more rich discourse about mm -hmm. aesthetics. And in some ways, the the conversation around indigenous uh, indigenous events on stage have to also they're they're going to have to blend into that conversation around what are the aesthetics that are going on on stage um, in oh. some capacity, right? And we're going to start to have a sort of an expanded conversation around that, possibly. Well, I'll briefly add to that in terms of what you're suggesting from a, a kind of intersectional perspective. Um, you know, the dialogue that happens is, for me, interesting to start from like an inquiry-based approach. And so that the critic perspective is very, again, it comes out of particular traditions and the idea of a kind of expertise and a well-made play having to kind of uh, live up to that expertise of the critic, but they, uh, yeah, not, it's, all it's, 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 not all critics, not all critics, but in, in terms of the, the discussion that happens, if there's an opportunity there for like an intercultural town hall kind of discussion of what is happening here, how do we understand that before we actually, what are we doing when we actually critique, that's sort of for me the question, mm -hmm. and from the perspective of marginalized uh, demographics, you know, and now, you know, transgender demographics, um, the idea of, just go back to, uh, to Taibo's question about the, the, the ghost, is that we talk about communities from different perspectives, and I'm not suggesting somewhere beyond or above, but the idea of seeing uh, community trajectories along a continuum, mm -hmm. and so where people are in terms of their makeup. There's a time where even Canadian theater was not critiqued so heavily as like you know, Euro-American uh, productions, because <laughs> one had a had a higher, you know, it had a longer trajectory, right? And it had time to kind of incubate. So in terms of putting everything up against the same, you know, whether standard, the same discourse for me seems, you know, potentially counterproductive, but without actually isolating communities and isolating dialogue, maybe there's a kind of opportunity for, whether it happens online or in rooms, to have these kinds of inquiry-based discussions, more dialogue and, and understanding, so that we're actually knowing what we're critiquing. Add that in the subject of like positionality for disc like people who are proposing discourse, um, you know, like a, a classic art school technique which is not included in our theater training often is like saying as as X I see this and it makes me think or feel that like that that that's not always part of how we're trained to respond to theater um, and dance and performance. So in some ways, I think that that tradition which exists elsewhere already is very much available to us to start to be able to ha continue to have dialogue. It's not a sh not shutting people out, right? It's saying we need to find a way to say from where I am I see this and it's and then you, you're able to acknowledge what you don't know and know and also acknowledge what it makes you feel whether you understand it or not, yeah. right? Like it, because it's doing this, because it flashed at me in the face for 60 minutes like uh, the strobe light, like this was my experience and this is what it made me think about and conjured for me. And in some ways those personal experiences are no different than love letters of like an audience member to what, they're, what they saw and felt during the show. Mm. Thank you. I think it's particularly interesting that when you bring in the idea of the critic that we're also talking about the creation of new archival materials and archives that are responding to performance archives. And I am mindful of the time. We have basically three minutes, which isn't even really enough time to ask another question, for which I'm very sorry. But I wanted to bring us back to one thing, one thought, which is that this, this panel was supposed to be 
focused on currents in Pacific Northwest performance research. And the questions and the comments that we've had here, some of them have been pretty international, I would say, in their scope. And so as you're leaving here in this space and taking a stretch and drinking water, I'd like you to think about some of the things that we've heard today that are specific to the Pacific Northwest or might be specific. And then we can talk to our panelists during the break and ask them about those things too. Uh, I'd like to thank our panelists, and actually this is, um, I, I got some gifts for the folks uh, that, uh, that were presenting today, and um, uh, the gift that I chose was um, uh, uh, a copy of Kim, of Kim Harvey's uh, Kim Lupa, so um, this ties back to those conversations. Also, uh, we don't have contributions for the next two days from Talon Books, but I think that, of course, um, the publisher plays a kind of key role in, um, in archiving uh, performance culture. Um, so I'll hand these out to you, and please join me in, in thanking our, our presenters for this <laughs>